Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and you are listening to or watching our video podcast, Radio Maine, where we explore and celebrate creativity and the human spirit. Today I have with me Megan Jo Wilson, who is the creator and founder of the Rockstar Camp for Women. I'm pretty excited to talk to you about this today. Likewise. I think this is such an interesting idea, Megan Jo, because when I read the impetus for this, it was all about confidence. Mm -hmm. And it was all about um, having women get up on stage and be able to work with their own presence and their own voice. I guess I have to say that I see this quite a bit. Yeah, There's quite a big difference between women and men and what they think they bring to any given situation. Yeah. So talk to me about your inspiration and why you decided this would be something you wanted to focus on. Well, I love what you said about this program is creativity and the human spirit. Is that were those words? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's what it's all about. So thank you for your voice and your work in the world. Um, the, the difference is stark between women's confidence and men's confidence. And I say that in a context of doing coaching work for 20 years now, working with men and women and doing business coaching Uh, And that's where the the really stark contrast became so revealed to me. I was uh, teaching coaches how to build a profitable business as a coach because most coaches get trained in the skills, but not how do I run a business? So I was running groups with men and women, and I'm teaching the tactics and know your client and create awareness and share what you're offering and charge a certain amount that will support your livelihood goals, your revenue goals. And the men, for the most part, would say, okay, and they'd go do it. And the women would just sort of spiral in this perpetual, I'm not ready yet. I don't know how to be an expert in public, the highly trained, brilliant, passionate, women. Um, I don't, I'm I'm terrified to do a Facebook live or share a post about what I really think. And as when it comes to charging money, now I'm really uncomfortable. uh, Because how do I receive revenue for my gifts, my wisdom, my talent? So it that experience is like, wow, there's something really profound here that I want to play with and see if I can shift because these women have such medicine to bring to the world and they're just um, stuck in sharing it. So I think it's actually a crisis of confidence. You know, I think it's pretty, it's pretty intense. (laughs) Well, I I have to agree with you because I I do a lot of work with um, mentoring and coaching women clinicians and um, in particular women doctors who are leaders. And it's interesting when I bring up imposter syndrome with men, male physicians who are leaders um, versus female physicians who are leaders, the men will be like, most of the time, no. Sometimes, yes, but it's pretty rare. But um, women who have been in the profession for quite a while, they will say, you know, I feel like I don't know enough, you know, why would people believe in me as a leader? And it sounds very similar to your experience just in the, in the broader context. Absolutely. Um, so what we tend to do then is get more training, get more certifications, try to collect more data, or I need, I'm not there yet. Um, and it's just a huge cost for all of us. So I'm a, you know, I've been a singer and performer for my whole life. And I've done all this coach training and all this leadership development training. And in all my leadership development training, I was noticing like, oh, I know how to do that. I learned that by being a professional musician, live musician. I know how to um, feel the energy of a space. I know how to connect with the other people. I know how to command a stage. 
I know how to uh, use my voice. I know how to like show up and shine, even if I'm tired and not in the mood. And I thought for years, there's got to be some way to play with leadership and voice and performance. And that's what Rockstar Camp was born out of, really, uh, because it is a leadership development program, the the concert where these women are l- quite literally, right, uh, Portland House of Music here in Portland, on stage, spotlight, live band, all men behind them by design, a live audience cheering them, and they just sing one song. None of them have musical training. Most of them have never sung in front of another person. And so they're having this somatic experience of being just, you know, not just seen and heard, but in the most extreme way and celebrated. So the concert is sort of the most spectacular piece of it, but it's really just a laboratory for us to see all the things that come up for a woman when she's placed in that position so that we can acknowledge it and heal it. And, you know, it's not our fault that we have imposter syndrome. We weren't born that way. You know, five-year-old girls don't have imposter syndrome. It's a learned condition, so you can unlearn it. You wrote your first song at 12. <laughs> I did. <laughs> and, and I love the story of singing Tina Turner. Oh, yeah. On your Cape Elizabeth lawn when you were <laughs> <Right>. growing up. <laughs> right. So it sounds like when I, when I know your background, I mean, it seems like you took this sort of five-year-old, eight-year-old, 12-year-old energy and, and you just kind of held on to it over That's time. That's so cool. That's beautifully said. Yeah. So how is it that you were able to do this and it's so hard for many women to do this? Yeah. Part of it is probably... I don't know, my astrology, my personality, my purpose, my spiritual, who knows, right? I I love to sing. I love to perform. I actually feel quite relaxed and at home. My version of Rockstar Camp would be like playing basketball in public or, you know, stand-up comedy. I mean, there's many places in which I would be like, oh, man, I can't do this. Um, But I love what you're saying, that my inner five-year-old is a part of my adult woman work. And I have this theory that um, because our culture is so confused, (laughs) a lot of our gifts um, are the things that we were criticized for as kids. Um. So I don't, I'm just meeting you, but I don't know, your inner five-year-old probably loved to talk to people and connect with people and play with people, you know, it's like, or, or your work in healthcare, right? Like you are interested in, in making the world a better place and interested in bodies and interesting. So, um, yeah, I think play and the things that like light us up and fill us up are a great compass for the work we're meant to do here. And the women that do Rockstar Camp, you know, it's funny when I offer it, you, there's a stark response. So if I said to you, Lisa, do you want to, what do you think about getting on stage to sing a song? Like, how do you respond? Oh, me personally? Yeah. I, I love getting on stage. Yeah. So you're like, like great. Give, give me a microphone, give me an audience anytime. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So for you, it's like, it sounds fun. Yeah. Let's do it. For many women, it's it's like, oh, you couldn't pay me enough. There is no way I would do that. And then some women say, yeah, do it. That sounds fun. And then the ones who join are like, ooh, there's something there for me. I'm terrified and I'm all in because there's something there that I know wants to be revealed. Uh, it's sort of like this archetype, right, of the rock star it's like an archetype oh my god this is why we love rock stars right they they're so unapologetic and free and if i could just tap into that part of myself maybe i'd have more permission which is what i hear all the time from my grads i just have so much more permission to whatever you know i just have more permission 
when I hear you say this, it's it brings up for me this idea that the people who sign up for your camp are really being so brave. So brave. Because they're not necessarily the ones who automatically would sign up for a camp. Exactly. They're the ones who really have to make a conscious decision to move towards something that is really scary for them. Yeah. So how do you kind of, how do you reach that particular group of people? Yeah. Well, they're out there, you know, so I, like I said, I've been in the coaching industry for 20 years. So we're at a time now where personal growth is just like almost an addiction for, for a lot of people, right? It's like, oh, how can I stretch my comfort zone even more? You know, we are at a place where sort of science and spirit is really integrating. And it's like, um, I want to look at myself. I want to grow. I understand that challenge is, is the space where I grow. Um, so that's sort of how I frame it. And I, I share that message in all kinds of ways through, you know, marketing and my coaching communities. I belong to a lot of women's groups and I haven't met a woman yet. And by the way, I did a rock star camp for men, which was amazing experience, but I haven't met a woman yet who has said, well, I don't, I don't get it. I don't think that's really an issue. I think we're all really <laughs> doing great. You know, we are doing great, but you know what I'm saying? Women get it when they hear about it. They get it. So it's, you've created something relatable. And like a lot of personal growth experiences, the challenge is translating the depth of the work because it, it looks on paper, you know, you, you've seen probably the photos, they're on stage and they're done, and it's the lights, and but it's also really deep. There's a lot of crying and screaming and uh, being in sisterhood is a huge component, teaching women how to relate to one another with actual love, with actual admiration with inspiration, which is our natural way of relating um, and is, you know, trained out of us from a very early age. So it's like such a relief and a deep healing. You know, so many of us have wounds with other women. So to be in community, that's why they're able to get on stage because they know their sisterhood's going to catch them at the end of it. And so when they have that, then they can face the next stage, which might be a podcast, a book, uh, a play they want to write. These are some of the things my grads create. They're not starting a band. They're starting a movement. They're starting a mission. They're they're saying, well, if I could do that, I can do anything. I love that because it is true that if you do things that are hard, then the next time something that's hard comes along, you say, well, I did this last thing. Right. And I now I'm, I can use that in that, that feeling, that information right. to do this next thing. You just, as you said that, this is a sort of an odd share, but I remember when I was in labor <laughs> saying, if I can do this, I can do anything. I'll never be afraid of anything ever again. You know, uh, it's like it just stretches. You get to see what your capacity actually is in a somatic way an embodied way. And our intelligence, women's intelligence is in the body. It's not, uh, you know, we are brilliant intellectuals, but our bodies have so much information and wisdom, but most of us are kind of operating from the neck up. It's like, we, because that's what we're trained to do. So you have to be in your body to sing. You have to be in your soul to make art. You have to be present to um, you know, just the joy of music. If someone sings a uh, happy birthday or a gospel song or whatever the song is with no emotion, it's like any art or paints without emotion. It's, it's not going to move people. Uh, but if you know how to feel and move people, you have a huge, uh, like a fairy dust as a leader. So one of the things that I'm, as you're talking, I'm, I was, thinking about a situation that I was in that I was going to go on stage with an individual. Mm -hmm. um, and he was a long time um, 
performer and really great musician. He actually was in, he was my teacher in high school. Oh, wow. So I was going to go and I was going to sing, but I wasn't really feeling it. And he said, that's not my problem. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) You know, you are, they hired us to do this thing. So you need to show up and you need to put yourself out there. That's right. And you need to be and embody this performer. That's right. You know, person, because that's what people are expecting. And, and I think that that also comes up for me when you're talking about this, because, you know, sometimes you, you really don't feel it. And we can't assume Correct. that all rock stars or people who get up in front of others always feel like doing it. I mean, sometimes it is actually work. And that doesn't matter. Right. That you, doesn't you, matter. You don't wait for the inspiration because this is the job. I love that. I love that. And there are really practical tools and exercises that I'm giving these women to like flip the switch, to flip the switch back into aliveness. I love that you're, that's not my problem. (laughs) You have a job to do. And part of that job is bringing your aliveness and feeling to this show because that's what the audience will need. So how do you do that? How do you do that in a boardroom? How do you do that at a family table? How do you do that in a newsletter you're writing? Uh, and when you have the tools to do it, um, for women in particular, when we're in our aliveness, we're very compelling, magnetic, and rolling. And most of us, because, again, we're trained out of that, um, just need some practices that can get us back into it. Uh, and they're very effective. And it's a discipline that, you know, it is a discipline because it's so easy to slip back into like zombie mode, kind of. The idea that you've just described, this idea of practices Mm -hmm. and kind of processes and just just show up and do the work. Mm -hmm. I think that is really powerful because a lot of times people get stymied by, I, I don't know what the next, I don't know what the next step is. I have right. this overarching vision for my life, but how do I actually get there? But I do think that when you break it down and, and you start acting as if, you mm-hmm. know, you start kind mm-hmm. of creating the mental, the neuron connections, mm-hmm. I, I do think it makes it much easier for the next time and then the next time and then the next time. Yeah. So the fact that you're talking about moving your 20 years worth of coaching experience into okay, I'm going to create some strategies, some practices. I'm not going to throw you up on stage right away. We're going to work through this process. And on the other side, you will have what you need to have gotten to this place where you can perform in front of a group. Right. And this arc of the camp now, it's about three months. So actually, I give them tools. It's like I give them enough that they can do it off. Do it off. I give them enough that they can pull it off, but uh, I don't give them a year to train their voice. It's I really want to push them in the deep end. And I remember one of my grads, Susan, going, wait, we're not, you're not going to give us voice lessons? And I do a little bit of vocal training, but I said, no, you don't need voice lessons. You don't need voice. What you need to know is your magnificence and your pleasure. You need to sing with pleasure. You need, if you sing for yourself and you are in your pleasure, uh, you'll be magnificent. And even if you're not, you'll feel great about it anyway. And she, uh, she said, I'm a little faint. I'm a little, <laughs> I'll never forget the Zoom call. She literally got faint. You know, And this is how powerful the body is, right? Well, this is why we get dry mouth and sweaty armpits and hands because our digestion system is shutting down, preparing for a battle. Even when we're just about to do a keynote speech or a podcast interview or sing on stage, like how amazing is the body that it does that? That's, it feels like battle. It feels like life or death for a woman to say, or many women, I will say, Uh, this is my voice. This is what I have to say. This is what I believe. This is my expertise. This is what I stand for. So Megan Joe, in contrast, when you had the rock star camp for men, what did that look like? Yeah. What, what did you, I guess, learn from that Mm -hmm. experience or observe from Mm -hmm. that experience? So much. Uh, 
it was really funny. I, I did it because several men, friends of mine said, we really want to do this. One of them was even a little offended that I was only offering it to women. And I said, well, if I can get enough men that want to do it, I'll give it a shot. And I immediately had enough men who wanted to do it, which was fascinating. I did not change the curriculum. I did not change the tools because it really was a social experiment. And I worked with enough men and I'm, you know, intelligent enough to know that women are not the only people who struggle with imposter syndrome. Women are not the only ones who have stories and inner critics and, you know, issues with our bodies and our presentation. Uh, and um, I really feel for our men, our amazing men, because a woman can like go like this on her phone and find an empowerment workshop, right? There's just so much for them. For men, it's getting better, but it's a little bit harder to find community and support in being a man uh, and being a white man in particular right now. It's a very strange place to be. So what I learned was, you know, and we were laughing because the biggest questions were like, should the menu be the same? <laughs> like, are we going to do like, should we have beer or wine? I don't do you want to have ribs? Exactly. It was so silly. It was like, what? The people, just feed them. Um, the, what I learned was that we all, um, when we have access to this part of ourselves, this, this kind of rock star quality, uh, we have access to more permission and men need that too. And as we already addressed, when it came to things like bragging, taking up space in a group, for example, there was just so little charge around it. There was just not any concern. It's just boys are given permission from a young age. You are supposed to take up space. You are allowed to, you will be a leader. You are surrounded by examples of other men being leaders. So it's it's the cultural influence that's so profound. And they have deep rage, deep grief, deep despair. And actually, the feminine that's in all of us can take us there. And for most men, diving into those depths is so unfamiliar and so liberating when they get to go there, especially rage, that they get to be in their rage. Because I have them really scream and we get baseball bats. It's, it, it gets wild. <laughs> women, this isn't true of all women, but generally we are taught we have permission to feel and to express our feelings so we can go there a little bit faster. Um, but they really express so much gratitude for that permission to be with their, uh, we're always with our feelings, right? But to have a space to go deep into it and be witnessed in it and honored in it and not told, you know, real men don't cry or settle down, you're a little too angry right now you know, this could get violent. And it was, that was just a really healing experience for them. This idea of rage mm. is so important because I do think we've been almost, and by we, I, I'm just as a member of the culture, not, yeah. not me personally per se, but we have been asking people to sublimate their mm -hmm. rage, which is a very Na anger is a very natural emotion mm -hmm. and it's, it is a very somatic um, experience as well. Mm -hmm. And th the fact of it is that if you have these energies and you sublimate them, they don't disappear. They mm -hmm. just, so, I mean, anger management, I think is, is probably not a bad idea, <laughs> but it's not like the underlying impetus for the anger necessarily right. will go away right? and nor will the feeling Right. So, <laughs> right. especially with what has happened lately, you got it. It's it just seems like we're just setting we're setting up our society, our culture for kind of just some sort of eruption at some point. Well, it's erupting. I, I also feel that's true, but I you know I didn't <laughs> want to go too far down that path. Yeah, it's erupting, which I think is a huge reflection of what happens when it is sublimated. Yeah. 
it will erupt. It is erupting. And if we had access to that in healthy ways, uh, we would feel our heartbreak and our outrage at what's happening and then go, oh, I can feel it. I can be with it. What am I going to do about it? What? Of course, I can't just stand by and let this happen. We are, so, you know, our culture is really good at distracting us and numbing us. And that's why we can just drive by a homeless person like nothing, didn't see it. Or look at the news and go back to shopping for sandals. If we had access to our feelings, which I think is what the artist brings to the world in a lot of ways, so we're like the smelling salts, go kind of wake up and feel something. Uh, we'd have a very different world. So I love what you're saying. And I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> you presented the metaphor of the kind of the stretching and the empowerment of giving birth. And yeah. so there is right there for, for people who have had that experience and not all people will have that experience. Right. Um, but men in particular, at least people who are biologically born male, mm -hmm. most likely they're not going to have that experience. Mm -hmm. They never have that ability to have this tremendous feeling of having gone through this mm -hmm. powerful, powerful energy and then coming out on the other yeah. side. Except when they were born. That's true. Good point. Because every human comes from a woman's body. Yes. And 8,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, women were worshipped for it. And it was understood we are the source of life. What could be more, like, worship worthy than that? And then you see the arc of a, a culture that not only was like, I don't know about women, very intentionally denigrated, erased, dismissed women. And it's really beautiful to see how that's shifting. And it's not, you know, just women who get it. Our men get it too. Many of them really get it. And I kind of go, yeah, you, you know what, what we're doing, it ain't working so well. Um, we need each other and any, uh, feminist who's anti-man is not going to build the world she wants. We need our men and we need to love our men and um, learn from each other. And the patriarchy, which is a word that's thrown, you know, it's, it, it's kind of, it's terrible for all of us, really. So this is my project of giving the tools and playing with ways to uh, decondition ourselves and, and see how that spreads. It's, you know, sometimes I think like many people, it's like, oh, is this even making a difference? I, I feel like it's a forest fire and I've got a spray bottle. But if you've got 4 million people with a spray bottle, you're going to put out the fire. So I, this is uh, my contribution to all the beautiful work that so many people and women are doing to shift our culture and our world. You've said a lot of really powerful things. And first of all, I want to thank you for acknowledging that by othering people, we're not really going to get very far. I mean, it's always felt really uncomfortable to me to say, well, I'm going to put men over here and I'm going to be over here as a woman, particularly since I gave birth to one male child and yeah. I have three stepsons. Right. But I also have five brothers right. and a lovely father. And, you know, I have a lot of really wonderful men and a wonderful husband. You know, I just so it just so it never felt great to me that in order to take back our power as women, we ended up having to take things away from people who also deserve to live. Right. We're, we're all in this together. And it's interesting to, when you look at like history of feminism, activism, organizing, there, if you, there's like waves of feminism. I don't know if you, but like in my mom's generation, she just turned 80. What she learned her generation of women in the 70s was really like, um, you know, well, a lot of public rage, which we still have, 
But it was very, when we were trying to kind of claw our way out of this, it's like we did develop these claws. And it was sort of like, man up, and we're equal, and I'm going to take back my rights. And then, like, the feminine kind of got lost in feminism, the feminine being soft and receiving and nurturing. And so it's really, um, it's really interesting to watch what many call this fourth wave, where it's like, we're all in this together. We recognize this binary map is not going to (laughs) work. And we all need to have access to this outrageous, playful, soft, nurturing, nonlinear way, like including that in addition to all the beautiful masculine qualities. Because we don't want to lose those. We need logic. We need linear. We need strategic. It's just we're so imbalanced in that side. Uh, You know, we could go on about medical industry forever, but I had a physical this week, and she... uh, she said, how are you? I said, can you be more specific? <laughs> she said, how's your mental health? I said, "It's you know, because she uh, knows that I, I live with depression and anxiety. So she gave me that form. What's that form called that you do with the numbers? The PHQ-9. The PHQ-9, Lisa. <laughs> so I'm filling it out, and as always. And she looks at the numbers, and she goes, oh, those are some high numbers. Are you concerned about your mental health? And I said, honestly, I am concerned that anyone right now would say they have no mental distress. That's what concerns me about the world we're living in, that so many people could say, no concerns, no concerns, nothing keeps me up at night, everything's fine. Um, She didn't quite know what to do with that, but we ordered some blood work. (laughs) I mean, that's that seems to be the response that often <laughs> right. we offer people. Like, right. I'm okay, like, okay, let's do some blood let's work. Let's see if, and this is not a criticism of your provider No, she's at amazing. All. And I mean, Western medicine, like, yes, let's do yeah. some blood work. Like, sure. Maybe that will help me sleep could. better. And I, I will of course. take it. But it's so interesting, you know, and I get it. It's like, we're going to separate the emotional, spiritual part of your life from what's happening in your body when they're just so deeply connected. And to imagine that a, how many questions are 10 questions, however many questions could assess my went- mental well-being, to me is insane. In the la- how are you feeling in the last two weeks? I, it's just, to me, it's absurd. Yes, I think you and I absolutely could have at least t- 10 <laughs> podcast <laughs> interviews exactly. on issues within the current healthcare I'm here system for, it. for sure. Yeah. And I know that you also worked within healthcare. I did. So you definitely have that I did. background. And a great passion for it. I yeah. I sometimes some days I'm like, I really should have been a surgeon. I love I'm I just think it's fascinating. Fascinating. Like amazing. It's look the bodies are amazing. hmm So maybe we'll do a Yeah, we'll do part two, (laughs) right. One thing I wanted to ask you about, because this hasn't been part of the the coaching that you've described or the rock star camp for women, but you also are a writer and you Mm -hmm. also, I know, have done some consulting work Mm -hmm. with Marianne Williamson Mm -hmm. and there was another... Uh, Mama Gina is sort of her public name, Regina Tomashauer of the School of Womanly Arts. Yes. And those are big names. Yeah. So what I really am finding fascinating is that you're able to embody all of the the spiritual and emotional and artistic, Mm -hmm. and you're also like, man, this is a business. Correct. And and (laughs) I'm going to write books, and I'm going to show people this is a business. Coaching is a business. Mm -hmm. You know, I can work with Mama Gina, and I can work with Marianne Williamson, and we can create things that are a value that other people will want to invest in. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't, you know, for some people, it doesn't have to be for me. That's my path of living in a capitalist world. I need to generate money to pay for the things. I don't have other um, revenue streams coming in, right? It's on me. So um, that's the path that's worked well. And until we don't have a capitalist society, don't know how we'll ever get there, but um, 
I really want to support other women in getting in right relationship with their money because a successful business is a business that makes a profit. And we, you know, this is true of men too, but let's just say for so many women, understanding money being, uh, I was going to say empowered, but it's even just like baseline understanding of revenue generation. It's just such foreign territory for so many women. And it's not that I, you know, if a woman just wants to be rich, to be rich, great. I I don't really care what her desire is. But the really cool outcome of being in right relationship with your money is that you can do more of the thing you're good at in the world, right? More than your message will have more impact and spread to more people. Because if I have the revenue to fuel my mission, to pay for the computer, to pay for the thing, to pay for my car that got me here, to pay... Um, then I, then I can bring more of what I have to bring. And that's really my passion. And I don't know why I have this, this odd combination of artist and strategist. You know, most of what I did with them was curriculum design, like sitting at my desk, just going module one, here's the worksheet. Um, that's just part of how my brain works. I can actually relate to this. Yeah. Because I I do also a lot of leadership development and curriculum design. And I really like it. It's so fun, right? It is really fun. <laughs> yes. But but you're right that when you talk about being someone who likes to perform and someone who's artistic and someone who's spiritual, that most people are like, oh, but those don't match up. Mm-hmm. But why couldn't they? Right. Well, you're going to get me started. There there used to be a restaurant. I can't even think of the name of it. And it's probably better that I don't. They had a, a menu, uh, an item on their menu called the Starving Artist. And I, um, when I was a young girl, my, I was, I, I am an artist. Okay. So I grew up in Cape Elizabeth, Maine, in a school system that had arts, but didn't really center the arts, very like sports centered, um, all white students, all white faculty. And I just wanted to do art all the time. I just wanted to make art. Like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I just want to make art. And my stepdad said, that's your choice if you want to be a starving artist. And everybody knows this term. And artists, we even sometimes wear it as a badge of pride. I'm so broke. Look at me. I'm so broke. I'm so starving. And I want to shift that narrative with every fiber of my being. Let's be abundant artists. Let's be resourced artists. Let's, you know, I get like, believe me, I get a good struggle can lead to some great art. But it's just so interesting that that narrative has survived for so long, right? Some of us get to be successful. Some of us are starving. Um... So I I really love to teach artists, healers, coaches, spiritual teachers, you know, you get to make money for your gift. You're going to, what does Michael Beckwith said? Like, you got to, to be the light, you got to be able to turn the lights on, something like that. Like you, let's learn how to redirect resources to the people that have such important stuff to bring to the world. No more starving artists. Well, given that this podcast is sponsored by the Portland Art Gallery, (laughs) we certainly agree with you on that one. Right. Because this is the thing that often seems to come up, which is we're going to support artists by going to an opening. Right. Fantastic. Thank you for coming. Also, please leave with some art. Also, please leave with some art. And also, please... uh, There's a couple things in the music industry that I find really wild. Most, you know, I played music full time for maybe 10 years. In a arc of like loading in, setting up, sound check, performing, breaking down, getting home. That's about an eight or nine hour arc. You will, for a woman who gets her hair or makeup done, you make negative $10 an hour. But for people to balk at a $5 cover charge, right? 
five bucks, 10 bucks. Like I'm, I'm bringing live music into your life. You bought a Starbucks coffee this morning that was eight ninety five, but you want to get on the guest list and get in for free and then have an $80 bar tab but you don't want to pay $5 to see, you know, five musicians play their souls out for three hours. It's just very bizarre. Whereas people will spend quite a bit of money to watch professional sports. Oh, yeah. And I have no problem with that. I mean, I think sports are fantastic. I spend many dollars watching professional sports. I mean, it's completely fine. And also you're, you're watching people who have gotten very good at what they do. Yeah. So why can't that be true in the artistic field as well? And that's the other piece of, of my work and, and your work. It's like, whose voices do we want to amplify? Who, and it's the voices in the margins that have the most to teach us. Um, so those are the folks that I want to, you know, women, people of color, uh, queer people, these are the folks that have the most to teach us um, because they are navigating under insane circumstances and they know better than anyone how to stay rooted in resilience, self-love, their identity, not apologizing. And um, we just don't, we just need those voices in the mix more and more. On the way here, this is so interesting, this just popped in. On the way here, I was driving and at the stoplight and there's one, a home, I, I don't know if she's homeless, a woman with a sign, as we see all over Portland. And I was looking for change, which I usually have. I couldn't find it. And I looked up at her I, and rolled down my window because if I don't have change, I usually try to just say like, hey, how you doing? And her sign was, had a lot of marker, a lot of words. And her sign said, just a reminder, something like, just a reminder, you're beautiful, you're amazing, and your smile really makes a difference to me, or something like that. I'm like, wow. I'm like, I'm, let's get her on the podcast, <laughs> right? Like, what does she, what's she have to say? How did, how did she come to that conclusion that that's what her sign would say? And we had a little exchange and I turned, put down the window and I said, I'll circle back on the way back. Will you be here? She said, I don't know. But I don't know. I'm rambling. But my point is we want more voices outside of the mainstream. I agree. Yes. And you've been doing this podcast for three years. Yeah, I've been doing this podcast for three years, but we've been doing podcasting since 2011. So many, many years of many, many different people. And, you know broad range. And I've learned a lot actually from pretty much everybody. So you're right. And it's not necessarily, it's healthcare leaders and artists and, you know, business people. And actually we, we interviewed somebody who was, had been unhoused and worked with Preble Street. Mm -hmm. And that was a fascinating conversation because I, I mean, how often do you actually get to sit down with somebody and say, so Tell me about your experience as opposed to I'm going to assume I know about your experience being unhoused. So grateful for what you're doing and so happy to be here. Well, thank you for connecting because originally you reached out because you knew Andy Patstone, Mm -hmm. who we interviewed not too long ago. And it is it is typically the way that this works is somebody connects to somebody who connects to somebody. Right. Which I love. Right. And I just reached out to you on LinkedIn like, thank you so much. Absolutely. And I was like, maybe you might be interested in what I do. And yes. it just kind of fell into place. I hope that you are able to get a completely full rock star camp for oh, women will. coming up. Yeah. It sounds like you've been very successful. So I'm sure that that will happen again. How can people learn about your work? Yeah, the best way is through my website, rockstarcamp.live. It's, uh, it's got really just full context of everything that's included. Because again, the show is just a small piece of it and lots of photos and stories of my grads, the impact that it's had. I always reiterate over and over again, you do not have to be a trained singer to do it. That's not what this is about. I've never had a singer performer get booed off the stage. In fact, oddly, sometimes the ones who are the kind of like the worst singers get the like biggest applause. I have people flying in from all over the country to come to the show 
to perform and also many, many people who fly in just to see the show. So I'll send you the date. You'd love it. It'd be so fun. And uh, I'm also on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn and all those things. Uh, just Megan Jo Wilson, M-E-G-A-N. And, you know, if you do a search, you'll find me. There's lots out there. Okay, very good. I'm Dr. Lisa Belisle, and you have been listening to or watching Radio Maine, where we explore creativity and the human spirit, um, sponsored by the Portland Art Gallery in Portland, Maine. Today we've been speaking with Megan Jo Wilson, who is the creator and founder of Rockstar Camp for Women. Thanks so much for coming in today. It's my pleasure. <laughs>